what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you won't be disappointed unless you're a hater you know haters always got something to say today's video as you can tell by the title is going to be another true crime and makeup tour tour what bro what are you talking about man true crime and makeup story where i sit here and i tell you this true crime story and i do my makeup this particular story was requested to me by savannah on snapchat and it's a lot in this story honey it's probably gonna be a long video if you are interested in hearing this story and seeing how i achieve this look then just keep on watching william george hirons was intelligent he was charming he was handsome and although he had been a petty thief since he was a child his early life gave no indication that he will grow up to be a murderer much less the gruesome lipstick killer or was he all right so i am back without the plant because she died. I tried to keep that plant alive as long as I could. I tried to keep the plant alive. Lord knows I did, but she just went on and tapped out on me. I don't know if she got the run or what, but mama is deceased. Today's video is a request from Savannah on the Snapchat. Savannah wrote me on Snapchat. She was like, girl, you got to look into this. And I was like, okay, my girl, I will. The overview of the story that I read already like had me ready to do a video on it but then as i started to research more and more and it got crazier and crazier i'm like i gotta cover this girl like i'm a news anchor i gotta cover this william george hirons he was the oldest of two sons born to george and margaret hirons he was actually born on november 15th 1928 making him a scorpio like myself Shout out to all the Scorpios. We the best. The family lived in Chicago, Illinois, and they were they were kind of poor. They were kind of poor. George and Margaret, they argued a lot, especially like about finances. Hell, they argued about everything. They argued about everything. Now, because of this, William would often leave the home and wander the streets to avoid hearing them argue just get out of his little toxic environment he really wasn't down for hearing all this so he would leave the house now unfortunately the young child found entertainment out in the streets in the form of petty theft at 13 years old he was arrested for carrying a loaded gun child why is you out here 13 with a loaded gun this led police to do a search of the hirons family home now the search led the police to a number of stolen weapons chatter was arguing so much they didn't know their child was bringing in all the guns william was also storing things at an unused shed that was located on the roof of a nearby building now over at this shed that's where he had the high dollar stuff honey that's where he had furs homeboy had jewelry suits cameras radios all kind of stuff that he had been stealing from the neighborhood like just just going about taking all kind of stuff like mr sir why is your little ass ricocheting in people's homes and they say well, children don't need whoopings he needed his little behind beat okay he needed a good whooping out here stealing folks stuff now william he admitted to 11 of the robberies and then he was sent to jabal gibal i don't know how to pronounce it but we're gonna pretend like i do it's a school for wayward boys and so he was sent up there now after those little months were up apparently he ain't learned a lesson at all because within weeks of his release he was arrested again for lost ugh larceny and theft he just could not stop stealing he was like the little sims character you know you could set up sims characters some of them to just want to steal like to just be a narcolept it's a narcoleptic people that there's somebody who falls asleep kleptomaniac he was a klepto or at least he moved like one whatever the case was he wouldn't stop stealing they caught him again now this time he was sentenced to three years at a catholic college prep school which i didn't know you could be sentenced to a prep school during this time at the catholic school he excelled like william was a very smart child he was very intelligent very charismatic he was well in his studies his test scores were so high that the school urged him to go ahead and apply for the university of chicago's special learning program he was accepted into the school just before his release he was asked to begin college courses in 1945 during the fall semester and this allowed him to bypass high school altogether remember he was 13 when he started this he's now 16 going straight to college after he left the catholic school he returned home to live with his parents because mind you you know he's only 16 so he's not quite old enough to just be on campus living and just doing the whole college thing 
a hundred percent he and his parents thought it would be best for him to live at home and attend the classes and commute back and forth from home to his classes and that's what he did for a while but after a while they felt like it was kind of impractical and so they allowed him to move to gates hall on campus i don't know if i mentioned before but his family was kind of poor so they really didn't have the money to pay for his boarding or his tuition and william really didn't want to return to his regular life like he really liked college he really wanted to stay there and better himself and so he began working a couple nights a week he wasn't quite able to pay all of his tuition all of his boarding and take care of all his needs so y'all know he had the little kleptomaniac spirit on him honey so he started to steal again if he really ever stopped now according to one of his classmates William was an exceptional student, which we already knew because he bypassed all the high school. But anyway, she said he was very charismatic. She said that he was very popular, especially in the ballroom dance classes that he took. Like he was extremely popular in dance. Was he one of the girls? Because why would you ballroom dance? I don't know. Maybe that's maybe I'm thinking of something else. Anyway, he was he was just that girl. Okay that girl for sure william is just stealing dancing and doing his schoolwork on june 5th 1945 43 year old josephine ross is found dead in her apartment she seemingly died from multiple stab wounds to the neck her head is completely wrapped in a skirt and the wounds to her neck have been cleaned and taped shut Cleaned and taped shut. Why? Cleaned and taped shut. These folks just be doing anything. It was determined that she had been killed by an intruder. One who was likely there to burglarize her home. She ended up surprising them before they could complete the burglary. And then they attacked her. Y'all thought I was going to forget to hit that top lip, didn't you? I did too. Now, dark hairs were clutched in Josephine's hand, indicating that she had a struggle with the intruder before she succumbed to her injuries. Police interviewed her fiance. They interviewed several exes, all of which had airtight, solid alibis. Police had no other, no other suspect. They interviewed people in the neighborhood there were no sightings of like people that look suspicious in the neighborhood there were no witnesses no noise disturbances reported like no one had seen anything no one had heard anything just just nothing aside from the few dark hairs that they have found in josephine's hand investigators had nothing like there was nothing else left behind at the scene of the crime no clues no nothing six months later december 11th that same year 32 year old francis brown was discovered savagely murdered in her home <sighs> y'all unfortunately francis she was found with multiple stab wounds to the neck the knife was actually still lodged in her throat and then she had a gunshot wound to the head just like josephine francis's head was wrapped but hers wasn't wrapped with a skirt it was wrapped with a towel her wounds were somewhat cleaned up just like josephine's there was practically no evidence left behind no clues no eyewitnesses just a complete lack of evidence inside the apartment the police found no fingerprints they found no shoe prints, no evidence of burglary, and no hint of who the perpetrator could have been whatsoever. Now, there was one difference with the crime scene that stood out. A strange message written on the living room wall of her apartment with one of her own red lipsticks. The message read, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now, almost instantly, the media, they're all over this case. They're all over the case. It's all over the front page of the newspaper. It's on the news. The killer is dubbed the lipstick killer. Killer. and so people are just really they're really shaking in their spirit about this crime now what i found odd and very sad is that these two ladies were practically killed the same way the only thing that was different was the writing on the wall at francis's apartment the crimes are equally disturbing terrible and tragic but josephine didn't even get any kind of media coverage her murder wasn't even it didn't even make the front page of the newspaper they were just so intrigued by francis's case because of the writing on the wall with the lipstick and i think that's kind of kind of fucked up now for just under a month the city is held in a very sensationalized state of terror which was egged on by the chicago tribune because 
they were having news titles like when will he strike next and it's like bro it's bad enough like chill relax everyone was pretty much just waiting in suspense for the next crime scene to be uncovered and they did not have to wait long because literally right at a month the killer struck again Within the first week of 1946, that moment came. The moment everybody was waiting on. Now the third murder was definitely, without a doubt, the most brutal. It actually almost made me not do this case. When I was reading like the overview and I got to this part, I was like, no. No, 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 no. I did, however, decide to do it because this last victim wasn't like the entire focal point of the case. When children are the entire focal point of a story, I can't do it. I'm so sorry about it. Not sorry for real, but you know what I mean. I just, it's very triggering to me. I can't spend hours researching, writing notes out about the mistreatment abuse and murder of a child and then sit here for an hour and talk to you guys about it and not be affected and i know i said this before but i still get people all the time asking me can you do the gabriel fernandez case or can you do the more murders or can you do just cases with child victims and i, I just I know girl I cannot and then people don't understand they're like but you've done them before you did the Sylvia Likens case and it's like girl that's how I know I can't handle it like duh that's how I know how bad they affect me miss girl but anywho back to the story because now I'm rambling on the morning of January 7th 1946 at around 7 30 a.m. James Dagan he discovers that his six-year-old daughter Suzanne was missing from her bedroom now he immediately phones police police swarm the house they immediately began to search the upscale neighborhood inside the home a crumpled up ransom note was discovered inside of Susan's bedroom it was asking the family for twenty thousand dollars in exchange for her her safe return it also listed orders not to involve the police and claimed that further instructions will follow but it was a little too late for that because the police was already there the parents are kind of alarmed at this they're like okay yeah we might have effed up but the police they ensured the family that oh this is just a stunt don't take it serious we're gonna double the search efforts and find your daughter that proved to be a grave mistake because the letter was definitely not a stunt a man began calling the Deacon residence and hanging up before any type of like meaningful conversation can take place or you know before they can get a tap on the line he would just pick up the phone make his demands hang up the phone meanwhile the police doubled their search party and they began questioning neighbors trying to find out if anybody had seen anything unusual now later that same evening someone phoned the police anonymously and suggested that they look in the sewer near the Dagan home around 7 p.m just 12 hours after James Dagan had reported his daughter missing her seven severed head was found floating in that sewer near the Dagan home. The little ribbons that had been tied in her hair that morning still in place. Like I feel like that is just so, it's so sad. Now not long after the discovery of her head, her torso and her legs were also found in the sewer near the family's home. The rest of her was not located. Unfortunately, the family had to go forth with burying her without the rest of her. Terrible. Now let me show you something right quick because I'm using the Jaclyn Hill palette volume 2 and probably from there my makeup looks fine because I feel like it looks fine from there. When you zoom in, look at this. Look how patchy that is. And I keep reapplying the purple and it just it just keeps fading away like I'm not even touching it. I just packed it on there and it's still it's still leaving. Let me try by wig in the Jackie Ina palette and see if she could. Let's see if Auntie Jackie can save us. Now, police questioned hundreds of people. They even gave polygraph exams to 170 people. On multiple occasions, they claimed to have captured the suspect. They were like, yeah, we got him. This is our guy. And then it not being a guy. They were constantly doing this, constantly going through the same routine of ensuring the public that they had caught the killer and that someone was being brought to justice only for it to just fall through. And their so promising suspects had to be released because they really were not the killer. I look like I got two black eyes. Like, you know, sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's terrible quality of the makeup. Just give me a second, I'll be back. 
I'm not too fond of the Anastasia Beverly Hills eye primer this one and so I don't know if it was the primer or eyeshadow but I'm gonna say F them both for the rest of this video however I still want my pink and purple look so I'm just gonna use the fail proof neon mini palette from Huda Beauty love her and now a 65 year old janitor by the name of Hector Verber Ver Verberg Verber I'm not sure but anywho this guy the 65 year old man he was arrested as a suspect due to the fact that he worked as a janitor in the apartment building that the Deggins lived in and investigators said that the grimly state of the ransom note suggested it was written by a dirty hand and janitors often have dirty hands what bro what are you talking about man excuse me what type of police work is that exactly as ridiculous as this sounds to you and i the police were serious about this they were really serious about this and that this had to be their guy because he worked in the apartment building as the family he was a janitor the note was written probably by somebody with dirty hands and who has dirty hands janitor what kind of police work is that? What part of the game is this? They were so confident that they went to the press with this and they were just like, this is the man. This is our man. We we got him. And it's like, Miss Thing, no, you don't. They did all this despite discrepancies between Hector's profile and the profile that they themselves had developed as to what kind of person would have committed this crime. Because the profile for the killer that they had developed said that it would have to be one who had some surgical knowledge due to the way that the young girl was dissected or at least had to be a butcher mister was a janitor like that's kind of far from both you see how easy this blending now take notes miss morphe miss jacqueline for 48 hours this 65 year old man is beaten in police custody they beat this elderly man so bad that they actually dislocated his shoulder during the interrogation process now mind you this is way back in the 40s and the miranda rights thing wasn't a thing yet but i mean basic human rights are like you gonna beat this i mean who is beating on a 65 year old man why it's so unnecessary during this interrogation and the beating they're like urging him pressing him to confess he's refusing he's saying he's not gonna confess he had nothing to do with what happened to this young girl. He's just refusing to confess because he didn't do it. The janitor union lawyer, he was able to get Hector released from police custody. He was a good lawyer. He was able to get a court order for him to be released due to his unlawful treatment, unlawful detention. Also because there was no evidence and they were not, like they were refusing to let him see his lawyer. They were pretty much ordered to leave him the hell alone unless they found some, some type of damning evidence that proved that he was the person that had committed these crimes. And of course they didn't have anything. They didn't have anything but their notion that his hands usually be dirty and the person who wrote this note had to have dirty hands too it's like miss girl what now after hector was released he did speak to the press about his treatment or mistreatment by the police and the whole interrogation process it was made very public I'm gonna read you his statement it says oh they hanged me up they blindfolded me i can't put up my arms they are sore mind you they dislocated one of his shoulders they had handcuffs on me for hours and hours they threw me in the cell and blindfolded me they handcuffed my hands behind my back and pulled me up on bars until my toes touched the floor. I no eat. I go to the hospital. Oh, I am so sick. Any more and I would have confessed to anything. Poor guy. Hector, after this incident, ended up spending 10 days in the hospital. Hector actually couldn't even write English enough to be the person who even wrote this letter. As bad as the letter was written, his English was worse. He could not have been the person who left this random note. Ransom note. Well... It was random too, but anyway. Hector ended up suing the Chicago Police Department. He was not letting them off that easy, as he shouldn't have. Like, nah, bro, you dislocated my shoulder, got on my nerves, beat me, blindfolded me. He sued the Chicago Police Department for $15,000, but he was actually awarded $20,000. They may not sound like a lot, but this is back in the 40s. So in today's time, 2020, $20,000 is the equivalent to $264,000. They awarded him the 15 k that he had sued for, and then they awarded his wife another $5,000 for her distress because, y'all, 
they sat up here and tried to force this lady to implicate her own husband in this crime child disgusting okay just disgusting you know what's not disgusting though you know what's the opposite of disgusting how easy these bling compared to that jacqueline palette muy perfecto and don't come for me because i know that's perfect spanish word to have there so you see it was that type of police work that had them out here embarrassed and looking stupid now another notable false lead was Denny sherman he was a recently discharged Marine that had served in World War II. Now, while searching the rear of the apartment complex, the police investigators, they ran across a wire that they suspected had to have been used to strangle Suzanne. Mind you, there was no evidence of strangulation. Nobody even said she was strangled. They saw the wire and they said, hey, this wire must have been used to strangle Suzanne. It's like, bitch. When was she strangled? But anyway, next to the wire, they found a handkerchief with S. Sherman on it. And so they were like, this must be our guy. They took the handkerchief and they said that, oh, he must have made a fair, fatal error and dropped this while he was running to get away. They did a military record search and they found that a Sydney Sherman lived in the nearby area. So they decided to pay Sydney Sherman a visit, thinking yet again that they have found their guy. Now, when police arrive at Sherman's apartment to question him, they find that he had vacated the residence seemingly without notice. They also find that he quit his job without picking up his last paycheck and the these actions they thought like yeah this gotta be our guy anybody who was innocent would not leave their last paycheck behind honestly that does seem a little suspicious that he would leave his last paycheck behind but anyway they're still stupid so i'm not trying to give them too much understanding they start up a nationwide manhunt to find sherman they're like where you at where you at once again they're telling the public this is their guy they have to find him they're soliciting the help of the public to report any sightings of sherman anywhere getting everybody all riled up ready to whoop sherman out in the street now little sherman was found four days later in toledo ohio a little confused as to why everybody looking for him he explained to police under his interrogation that he actually eloped to toledo ohio with his girlfriend he denied that the handkerchief was even in his and uh he's at this time administered a polygraph test which he passes flying colors and then he is released as a suspect and they like oh my bad eventually the real owner of the handkerchief is found seymour sherman he was an air force airman and uh it was his now he was questioned as a suspect but he had been out of the country at the time that suzanne was murdered and so he had to be cleared he wasn't he was out doing military stuff away now while interrogating the local hooligans the police pick up a boy by the name of theodore campbell and they're questioning him interrogating the hell out of him under their questioning he said that he had nothing to do with it but he did admit that he knew who abducted and killed suzanne he pointed the finger at another local teenager by the name of vincent cast costa costa Castelloto, I believe that's how you say his name. Not sure, probably not. But Theodore pointed the finger at Vincent. He claimed that he knew that Vincent had something to do with it. Well, not something to do with it, that he actually killed Suzanne and had admitted it to him. Once again, the Chicago Police Department and the Chicago Tribune declared the Dagan case solved. Was this like the fourth time? Vincent lived only a few blocks from Suzanne's apartment building. Now, according to the story that Theodore told police, Vincent had told him that he kidnapped and killed Suzanne and disposed of her body. Vincent also allegedly told Theodore to make the ransom calls to her family. Now, this was in line with the mystery ransom calls that were made to the family on the morning of her disappearance. The police, they arrest Vincent and they interrogate him overnight on the basis that Theodore had told them that he had done it. Now the story began to fall apart when both Vincent and Theodore were giving polygraph tests and the results came back indicating that they had no knowledge of the crime whatsoever. They later admitted that they had overheard police discussing details of the crime and that's where they got the story that they had put together and uh, they actually had nothing to do with it. In February, Suzanne's arms were found in a sewer about a half mile down from where the rest of her had been located. At this time, the family had already put her to rest and so... <sighs> 
Yeah. Now, by April, 370 suspects were questioned and cleared. Child, the police was just... I don't even want the Chicago police to go looking for my dog. Like, at this point, if Blue go missing, I don't even want the help of the damn Chicago Police Department to find him. And of course, people were very upset and outraged because time and time again, they were assured, oh, we found the murderer, we found the suspect, we found the perpetrator, and it turned out to not be it. The police department were receiving a lot of pressure from both the media and the people to find out who had done this, for real, this time and stop playing and child they were embarrassed honestly at this point they were just beyond embarrassed at this point in june six months after the murder had taken place a man comes forward by the name of richard russell thomas he reportedly told police that he wanted to go back to chicago to take his medicine even if it meant the electric chair he was a male nurse living in phoenix arizona he originally was from chicago illinois at the time that he decided he wanted to confess to Suzanne's murder. He was actually incarcerated in Phoenix for molesting his own daughter. Not only did his handwriting match the ransom note, his job working as a nurse matched the profile that police had made of the killer who would have, you know, the medical background, the surgical skills. The only thing is he had some elements of the case wrong and you would think that especially after everything that the police had gone through with their terrible police work, they would be happy to jump at the thought of somebody handing themselves over as a suspect on a silver platter child regardless of whether or not they knew all of the details of what had happened because of some of the elements that he had wrong about the case the police didn't really want to take him seriously they also felt like he was trying to confess to the murders to get away from being imprisoned in phoenix for the molestation of his own daughters so because of these two things his confession was disregarded by police chicago police in addition authorities were much more intrigued by a new suspect that they had come across that same day the same day that richard confessed to the murders of suzanne they had zeroed in on somebody else's suspect so they really weren't trying to hear what richard was talking about they were like no nah, we got our next guy we got our next guy. There in Chicago, a college student was caught fleeing the scene of a burglary. The report stated that he tried to flee the scene. He waved a gun at police. He even tried to kill one in the midst of his escape. During this whole thing, Richard decided, you know what, never mind, I'm gonna recant my statement. But neither the police nor the press cared in light of their new suspect child. They was just like, I, right, uh, Richard, Robert, whatever, bye girl. Now the entire six months that the Chicago Police Department had been investigating the murder of Suzanne, Francis, and Josephine, our homie William, remember him? The story started out about him. In his thieving ways. He had been living his life like it was golden, living his best life at the Chicago University or the University of Chicago. He was a 17 year old young playboy living like one. Still working for his tuition money and also, you know, stealing on the side, robbing folks to help pay his tuition and his room and board at the University of Chicago. The day that this burglary had had happened was June 26th. William had just celebrated the return of his uncle from the war. He was taking up ballroom dance classes. He had taken up chess and he was really good at it. I don't even know why that's relevant, but he was busy, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Doing recreational thing. He was also in the midst of a budding romance with a classmate. He had found him a little bae. I inserted a picture of them because they was a cute little handsome little couple or whatever. Now on that day that the burglary happened, June 26th, William had planned on taking his girlfriend out on a date but he didn't have no money that was the problem that's why he did the burglary in the first place he was just trying to get some quick cash so he can take bay out okay that's it now he originally planned to cash a savings bond of a thousand dollars that he had stolen from somebody but when he got down to the post office he realized that there were clothes and he was like oh well can't do that no biggie, I can just rob somebody, I can just steal. He attempted to burglarize an apartment near the neighborhood where Suzanne once lived, but the resident of the apartment, they saw him trying to break in, and once you know he got in there and they locked eyes, he actually fled the scene, but then she called police. Police were actually nearby, and so they chased him on foot. He was followed by two policemen. The two policemen actually cornered William, and when they did so, he pulled out a gun from his back pocket, and he threatened them. He started waving it at them. Now, he claimed he had this gun on him just in case 
he was robbed while he was carrying the thousand dollar savings bond that he had robbed from somebody else it's like girl how are you gonna be concerned that somebody gonna rob you when you didn't rob somebody like this ain't even yours to be stolen from you insane there's three sides to every story your side my side and the truth is somewhere in between now the officers claim that william fired the gun at them william claims that the officers shot at him first whatever the case is shots were fired william fled he took off running again he must have been in amazing shape now he didn't get too far because an off-duty police officer still in his trunks from his day at the beach who was nearby and uh spotted the commotion took out a flower pot and bashed him over the head with it knocking him out after having his little head stitched up they transported william to the hospital wing of cook county jail now there he was subjected to a very torturous interrogation during which he slipped in and out of consciousness due to pain drugs and exhaustion so police they name him the lipstick killer they go and search his parents home they search his locker that he kept at a local train station they searched his dormitory now in his locker they found a bunch of stuff that he has stolen none of which belong to any of the suspects just some random stuff that he had picked up along the way. They took his fingerprints and they discovered that he was a nine point match to those found on the ransom note of Suzanne Degan. That's important to remember, a nine point match. And if you don't know, by law, it has to be at least a 12 point match to be deemed a match. Police began accusing William Hirons of being the lipstick killer. They're telling him, confess, we know it was you, we know it's you. Meanwhile, he's like, no. It wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not confessing. I didn't do it. Meanwhile, the police are becoming more and more frustrated with him. They're like, yes, you did. We know it. We know you did. Just admit it. In an effort to get him to admit to at least one of the murders, police enlisted the help of a couple nurses and a doctor and resorted to a more sinister method of interrogation during one interrogation session a nurse poured ether on williams genitals while he was strapped to a hospital bed now ether if you don't know which i didn't know myself before reading about this it's a odorless liquid that's like highly flammable it was once i don't know if it still uses an anesthetic but i know of once well during this time it definitely was it's also used as an illicit drug to like induce euphoria or like sedation now it also burns if you pour it directly on the skin and so they were pouring this on his genitals trying to force him to confess when this didn't work and he still would not confess one police officer started punching him in the stomach while he was chanting out the details of the Dagan murder case and saying you know you did this just admit it you know you did xyz to this girl and he's just like but i did not four days into his interrogation yes they had held on to this man for four days a spinal tap was administered to william in an effort to force him to confess to being the lipstick killer right after the spinal tap was administered they scheduled a polygraph test but he was in too much pain from the spinal tap for an accurate reading to actually even be assessed one doctor even injected him with sodium pentothal which is a truth serum but that did nothing more than put him in a state of delirium like he was really out of it once they gave him that he was actually only semi-conscious and so after they tried for a while to administer the polygraph anyway once they realized that he was in no state to produce any kind of answers that would give them any kind of viable results they decided to reschedule the damn test for a couple days later. When the polygraph was actually administered the days later, they reported that the results were inconclusive. Not deceptive, but inconclusive. William was interrogated around the clock for six whole days. He was constantly abused and beaten by police. He was not allowed to have food and water. He was very weak. He was just... Child, he was in, he was a mess. He was not allowed to see his parents for the first four days. Now, mind you, he's only 17 at the time. 17. So they should have contacted his parents as soon as they picked him up, but they didn't. He was also refused the opportunity to speak to a lawyer for the entire six days that they held him, interrogating him, held and torturing him. After six torturous days and William still maintaining his innocence and not letting up on the fact or his side of the story that he had not committed any of these crimes he didn't know what they were talking about because i steal i don't kill i'm childish anyway two psychiatrists joined the investigators they gave him another dose of the truth serum without his consent without his parents consent and then they tried to 
interrogate him yet again. Under the influence of the drug, one of the psychiatrists, Dr. Grinker, claimed that William began to mutter the words of a confession. He stated that while hovering between unconsciousness and excruciating pain, William began to tell the story of a guy named George who could potentially have committed these murders. Police searched for a guy named George. They questioned his family. They questioned his friends and classmates, his girlfriend. Like nobody knew of a George except for the fact that William's father's name was George and William's middle name was George. The fact that William's middle name was George led the police to believe that he was actually indirectly telling on himself like confessing but using his middle name. And so with that, they decided to charge him with the murders. On July 12, 1946, 17 days after his arrest, William is indicted for assault with the intent to kill, robbery, 23 counts of burglary, and three counts of murder. Now, despite the fact that the interrogation was completely botched and effed up and inhumane and just all of the things not to mention all of his places of residence all of his private property had been searched without a warrant william agreed to a full trial maintaining his innocence even though he risked being sent to the electric chair if he went to trial and he lost they were gonna give him the electric chair for sure but he felt like he was innocent and so he could prove that he you know did not commit these murders First, there was the handwriting analyst who said that his handwriting was not a match to the person who wrote the lipstick message. And when they weren't able to link him to the message, police then claimed that his fingerprints matched a print discovered at the scene of the Francis Brown crime scene. A fingerprint that was first reported as a blood smudge and like the opening of the doorway. On the original reports, it was not a fingerprint. It was never a fingerprint until they weren't able to link him to the handwriting on the lipstick message. Then they were like, oh, well, we got a handprint. They also claimed that a fingerprint connected William to the ransom note in Suzanne's case with nine points of comparison. And like I stated before, you have to have 12. Now at the time, William's legal team, as well as his supporters, pointed out that in the FBI handbook, it has to be 12 points of comparison to be deemed a positive match. And so they had to concede with that little notion. It's like, girl, y'all just really trying it. Next, they announced that while searching his dormitory without a warrant, mind you, they retrieved a medical kit that was stolen. The medical instruments, however, could not even be linked to any of the murders. There was no DNA, no trace of biological material whatsoever on any of the instruments no hair no blood no skin no nothing it was as if they had never even been used no biological material no dna was found on any of williams things they tested his clothes for dna nothing was found that matched any of the victims the prosecution they were looking pretty bad out here like it was looking pretty bad child until they hit a turning point the turning point in the case for the prosecution ultimately solidified this botched interrogation and this botched case against william was an eyewitness by the name of george e sabrunsky he don't even sound like he can be trusted but Whatever. He was an active duty soldier who had made a statement the day after the murder of Suzanne Dagan. It stated that he saw a figure walking in the direction of the Dagan resident with a shopping bag in hand. He said that the person that he saw was about 5 feet 9 inches tall, weighed probably about 170 pounds, was about 35 years old, and was dressed in a light colored fedora and a dark overcoat. Now, the witness said that due to the lack of lighting, he could not make out this person's facial features. When police showed George a picture of William on July 11th, he could not identify William as the person that he had seen that day. But on July 16th, just five days later, if I can count, I'm no mathematician. During a hearing, George is being questioned again, in walks William, and then he stands up and points and he's like, that's him that's the man right there that i saw Child, i think the police had got to him i think the police probably pay him and was like look you can't identify him as the man but you better just say it was him either that or they poured some of that little stuff on his nuts too i don't know but it had to be one of the two now before this day things were looking kind of you know all the evidence was kind of shifty and they felt like they could really win this as the defense but when they got the eyewitness up there acting a fool like that williams lawyers pretty much told him just accept a plea to avoid the electric chair they told him just take a plea deal just take a plea bargain the deal that the prosecutors offered him was one life sentence 
sentence if he confessed to the murders of Josephine Ross, Francis Brown, and Suzanne Dagan. They felt like, I mean, yeah, it's life, but it's better than getting the death penalty. And a quote from William himself was that, the thing is, once you're dead, there's no clearing things up, he said. When you're alive, you still have a chance to prove that you weren't guilty. So his plan was, okay, I'll take the life sentence now and then I can help solve this case and prove my own innocence. That was his plan. So with the help of his lawyers, he began drafting up a confession using the Chicago Tribune newspaper articles as a guide for him to even know the details of what had happened in each murder. Both William and his parents signed the confession because mind you, he's only 17. They agreed for July 30th to be his official date to make his confession. And on that day, he, his parents, his defense attorney, they all went to the prosecutor's office where the prosecutor had assembled several several reporters to witness the confession and ask William questions. Now, during this whole mess of a meeting, the prosecutor decided this was his moment. He wanted to shine, stand up there and give a speech, right? William just sat there slumped in a chair looking all defeated. He gave very non-committal answers, very vague answers to the reporters. Meanwhile, prosecutor is up there just shining bright like a diamond, giving his whole speech about how they've been waiting so long to get this confession and get this truth out of William that at last the truth was going to be told he kept emphasizing this word truth like truth truth finally truth and this really bothered William William asked the prosecutor like is it really the truth that you want the prosecutor was like yes and William pretty much thought that, that was some bullshit because literally he's sitting here listening to you give this speech about the truth and how important the truth is and we want the truth no matter what when he was literally being forced to lie in order to save his own life it made him angry so he decided to tell the truth which was that he did not do any of this he told the room that he did not commit any of these crimes that he had only stole some things but he had killed no one and that he was being coerced and told to confess to crimes that he did not commit and child everybody got upset everybody was mad the prosecutor was mad the defense attorney was even kind of upset that his client had reneged on what they agreed to the prosecutor was so trifling i was gonna say the prosecutor was so mad but he was just trifling he was so upset that he took back the deal and revised it to include three life sentences to run consecutively not concurrently not at the same time but like back to back to back girl we only get one life how am i gonna serve three lives Actually, don't answer that question in the comments. I know how the system works and how life sentences work. So I know why people get consecutive life sentences. I was just just making it funny. Now, the prosecutors told him that now he can take this deal. This is as good as it's going to get for him. Three life sentences instead of just one unless he wanted to go to trial and they convinced him that if he went to trial he was going to get the electric chair period if he went to trial they were going to pursue the electric chair with a little old eyewitness they threatened to also charge him with the murder of a lady by the name of Estelle Carey even though he was attending that little school for wayward boys at the time that she was killed how would it have been him but child like they just they just really did the most august 7th which is about a week after he reneged on his confession after a lot of backlash and the upset from his own legal team and in fear of losing in trial and being given the electric chair william agrees with the new plea agreement of three consecutive life sentences the prosecution as well as the defense at this point his own attorneys told him that he better confess and make it believable so this time william spoke a lot more he answered questions with more detail even reenacting parts of the murders that he was confessing to and in an effort to really get back at william for how rebellious he had been with the first confession the prosecutors like they really made a spectacle of it this time they even took him to the dagan home and had him reenact how he snuck into their window and snuck out with suzanne and front of the public and all of the press and this changed a lot of opinions of the people who supported him and believed he was innocent from the jump like a lot he lost a lot of supporters behind this immediately after he confessed he did let it be known in an interview that he confessed to save his life like not because he was guilty but to just to just save himself in the presence of his family and the families of the victims william in court admitted his guilt on the burglary and murder charges that same night he tried to hang himself in his cell he timed it to coincide with like the shift change of the prison guards but unfortunately 
Well, I was about to say, unfortunately, I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. Unfortunately, I guess for him in the moment, he was discovered before he died. As William is waiting in Cook County Jail to be transferred to Stateville Prison, a sheriff asked him like, if Suzanne had suffered when she was killed, he tells the sheriff, I can't tell you if she suffered. I didn't kill her. Tell Mr. Dagan to please look after his other daughter because whoever killed Suzanne is still out there. Within days of him going to court and admitting to the murders, he is maintaining his innocence he pretty much starts his campaign for his freedom mary jane blanchard which was the daughter of josephine she actually was in support of william she did not believe that he had killed her mother at all she said quote i cannot believe the young hirons murdered my mother he just does not fit into the picture of my mother's death i have looked at all the things hiron stole and there was nothing of my mother's things among them now during william's post-conviction petition in 1952 the prosecutor admitted under oath that he not only knew about the ether being put on his genitals he had authorized and paid psychiatrist Grinker a thousand dollars to administer the truth serum and then question him after the fact just dirty and crooked Grinker that psychiatrist in the same year also admitted that during the questioning William never began a confession because you know he had said that William had blamed it on a guy named George and it was like him indirectly blaming himself because George was his middle name or indirectly admitting to the, the murders because that was his middle name. He later stated that that never happened and he never in no way implicated himself in any of the killing. Now remember Richard Russell Thomas who confessed to killing Suzanne the same day that William had his little shootout with the police? Many people believe him to actually be the real killer and here's why. There's multiple reasons and a lot of evidence that points towards him. One, he had previously been convicted of an attempted extortion where he had written a ransom letter that had threatened the kidnapping of a little girl. The ransom note from his previous conviction had a lot of similarities to the one from Suzanne's case. Not just the handwriting itself, but like the way it was worded, the way it was mapped out was pretty much the same as the one in his own conviction. Russell Thomas was admittedly in Chicago at the time of the murder. At the time he had confessed to killing Suzanne, he was awaiting sentencing for molesting his own daughter, so we know he's a piece of shit. He also had a long history of violence, including spousal abuse, so we know he likes to beat the ladies. Russell was also a nurse who liked to masquerade around as a surgeon. He used to pretend in front like he was the actual surgeon. He was known to steal hospital supplies and he would boast to his friends about him being in the medical fields and him being a doctor. And of course the Chicago police, I mean they ain't all that credible or smart over there, but they had developed a profile of the killer having surgical skills. Now, Russell also frequented a car dealership near the Dagan's residence, and parts of Suzanne's body were found in a sewer that is exactly adjacent to that car dealership that Russell used to go to a lot, like literally right across the street. Now, like William, he was a known burglar. They had that in common. They liked to steal, okay? And we all know that he had confessed, but oddly, get this can you believe this after police zeroed in on william the confession all of the evidence that was documented pointing to russell being the perpetrator was lost or destroyed soon after william hirons was sent off to prison his parents and his brother they changed their surname to hill I guess because, you know, they didn't want to be attached to that anymore. His parents actually divorced as well right after his conviction. Now, William Hirons, he was first housed at the Stateville Prison in Joliet. Is it Joliet? Illinois. He took up several trades, including like electronics repair, radio repair. That's an electronic electronic repair he even had a repair shop a little business going hustling inside you know not giving up hope well actually he tried to give up hope a couple times because he did make three total attempts at suicide but for the most part he was you know he was doing more than i would have done child because i would have just been through in a mess in there when i say i would have been a mess honey on february 6 1972 he became the first prisoner in illinois to obtain a four-year degree he actually managed the garment factory inside stateville for five years he was the boss an overseer of 350 other inmates so he was like a model little 
prisoner. After five years, he was transferred to Vienna Correctional Center. There, he set up their entire educational program for prisoners. He helped other prisoners get their GEDs. He helped them with their appeals. He was kind of like a jailhouse lawyer of sorts, helping out other inmates. Now, for as for his own appeals, in 1965, he was given an institutional parole for the murder of Suzanne. And the following year, he was discharged in that case as the suspect. So he was pretty much taken out as the suspect on that case and then he started his second life sentence oh child if he just had a, taken the first plea deal and had that one life sentence this would have been a great a nice little point for him like he would have uh, he could have got out now he did continue to fight for his own freedom and at one point magistrate gerald Kahn he ordered illinois to release william immediately but the brother and sister of suzanne who still believed that he was responsible for their sister's death they went public pleading with authorities to fight the ruling. They petitioned for him to remain incarcerated and ultimately the Illinois State Senate decided that William's release at the time was not in the best interest of the people. For 65 years, William Hirons, he remained incarcerated, fighting for his freedom and maintaining his innocence. In 1998, he was moved to the hospital ward. He suffered from diabetes, which had swollen his legs and nearly blinded him. And so he was confined to a wheelchair. In 2002, a petition was filed on Williams behalf seeking clemency after a former Los Angeles police officer Steve Hodel Hodel I think it's Hodel H-O-D-E-L y'all know phonics sometimes sounding it out fails you if it don't always work he has spent 25 years in the force he was no rookie he was a very seasoned cop he met William he spent some time talking to him and he was convinced that William was innocent he said that he felt compelled to write this petition on William's behalf to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board stating his professional belief that William was innocent fortunately the appeal was denied William's final parole hearing was held on July 26 2007 with the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, right? They decided in a 14 to 0 vote that he would not be released. Asshole board member Thomas Johnson stated right there at the hearing that God will forgive you, but the state won't. Thank you, Thomas. Now, on February 26, 2012, William was taken to the University of Illinois Medical Center due to complications of diabetes. Seven days later, on March 5th, unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 83. Up until his death, William Hirons maintained his innocence, and at the time of his death, he was Chicago's longest serving criminal. 65 years, 65 years in prison. Went in at 17, died at 83. I'm not a mathematician, so if that's that's not right don't slander me because it'll be a waste of your time child and remember the hair the hair that they found clutched in Suzanne's hands either that was tested against William and did not come up as a match and nobody brought it up or they didn't test it at all like that was never entered in any kind of evidence I don't even know why the defense didn't even ask for it I don't get it but anyway 